Hello everyone, I'm Kristen from Forthright. Welcome to a special panel discussion where we'll answer the questions you asked during the previous four episodes of the Forthright Cyber Series on Cyber Hygiene. We did pre-record this discussion because getting the four panelists together at the same time was a bit of a challenge. But don't worry if you have any follow-up questions, please just put them in the chat and we will email the answers from the panelists to you directly. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to Heath to kick things off and introduce our panelists. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we, we wanted to put together a little special extra bonus episode to the cyber series we've been doing about uh, uh, cybersecurity hygiene and, and that essential cyber hygiene you need to make sure you're implementing in your organization. Uh, I'm Heath Geeson, I'm the CISO here at Forthright, and I have a background in working with many different organizations across different different areas. I uh, have recently been uh, working in operations at, at a couple different uh, large security organizations. And when the opportunity came along for me to join Forthright and to help improve our security practice internally and to bring some of my background and knowledge to uh, our clients, I was very excited about doing so. So I, I'm glad that we're getting a chance to do this and kind of answer some of the questions that have come in over the course of our our cyber series. If you haven't had a chance to see those, I encourage you to do so. You can go to success.forthright.com slash cyber series, and you can review the four part series we did on essential cyber hygiene. That said, I'm going to uh, turn things over to Frank Marino, our COO, and let him introduce himself. Frank. I'm Frank Marino. I've been with Forthright now for about 18 years, give or take, and I uh, have. Um, I've been running all the services that come out of Forthright. Um, we've expanded those services over the last several years to uh, enhance our security practices. Day-to-day uh, -day activities are just ensuring that the good people here are doing great things. So uh, I'm excited to be uh, part of this series and talk about what we've seen in our own use cases. Uh, one of the areas that I've been working on myself is making sure that security is more of a uh, enabler and not uh, getting in the way of getting things done. I'm all about getting things done. With that, I will pass that over to Rory. Thanks, Frank. Um, so I'm Rory Sanchez. I'm the CEO at Forthright Technology Partners, and uh, I'm excited to be here with uh, probably the three guys that I would turn to when uh, I need either something having to do with cybersecurity, technology in general, um, a GRC being uh, governance, risk management, and compliance. Um, you know, you're the guys that uh, that help me to uh, to understand the uh, the complexities of all the things that are going on out there. So, uh, uh, Heath, thanks for doing the uh, cyber hygiene series, and uh, thanks for putting this together. Last but not least, uh, let's get an introduction from uh, Tim Marley. I've got this cable here that I have to do something with. Uh, Tim Marley, uh, one of the favorite people who I've worked with in my career. Um, Tim, if you'll introduce yourself. Absolutely. Tim Marley, I am not with Forthright, but uh, have been a cybersecurity leader for the last 20 years and uh, IT leader for, for over 30. Um, whether it's vCISO, fractional Cisco, IT GRC, IT security uh, and compliance assurance, I'd, I'd like to say I've seen and done it all. I've certainly seen and done a lot. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I do have uh, very fond uh, feelings for, for both Rory and Heath. And not that I, I don't towards Frank, I just haven't had the pleasure of working with Frank uh, up to this point, but certainly have had a uh, wonderful relationship with Rory and Heath. And I'm excited to be here and, uh, and contribute any way that I can today. Thanks for including me, fellas. Tim, you're in good hands. Um, I've I've known these guys actually longer than I've known you. It seems like uh, Heath and and Frank and I probably go back, oh I don't know, at least 20 years. I think I've known Frank the 18 years that he's been at Forthright. Um, so uh, you know, it's good to have you. Uh, good to have you here, and you. Uh, getting you getting you into the family. Absolutely. <laughs> hey, so one of the questions that has come in that uh, I kind of wanted to kick things off with is um, having to do with user education. Um, the question was, what role does user education play in a successful cybersecurity strategy? Um, Tim, do you want to kick that one off? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
our users are the front line of really of our security program and not only our security program, but any potential problems we may have. I think, I think everybody on the panel would agree that, that there are no silver bullets in security. And uh, while we, at least in my own experience in my own career, uh, most leaders have come to me looking for, for technical solutions or deploying a tool or deploying a solution. And, that, and that's a great start. Uh, if we don't educate our people on how those tools work and the importance of those tools, uh, then, then it doesn't matter what, what, what solutions we deploy. Users are, are very smart and they'll find a way around those solutions. Uh, I'll give an example. Um, I said I've been in, in IT for over 30 and security over 20. And in one of those roles, I worked with a large health science center, a school that, that had uh, uh, thousands of medical students and uh, hundreds, uh, almost thousands of, of doctors. And uh, those doctors were spearfished. And I, I don't know how much we want to get into specific attack vectors, but effectively the bad guys went directly after those doctors. Uh, and it was it was very appealing. It was through email. And they said uh, effectively, hey, uh, you've been awarded a, a, a big financial uh, bonus for your work at the school. And uh, and we want you to sign into our, our payroll system and verify that. Here's the link uh, to that to that. Uh, you know, that payroll system. So they, you know, who wouldn't get excited about a bonus? Who wouldn't get excited and want to make sure that your account is accurate and, and you know where this goes? I, I know these, these fellows know where this is going. The link looked just like the payroll system. It wasn't. It was actually redirected through a middleman, through our bad guy. And, uh, and when they went in to verify it, the bad guy got their credentials, re-diverted the, the bank account to their own offshore bank, and lo and behold, uh, the university ended up losing uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in that case. And and again, I don't I won't berate this or take up our whole time, but but uh, these are key individuals in the organization uh, that had been through training, uh, but still managed to get around some very good controls that were in place. Uh, so in my mind, it uh, in many ways it starts and ends with the uh, the end user. You know, these things have gotten so good, right? We we work in cybersecurity, and yet every day, one of us, if not all of us, like we get an email, and you look at the email, and you want to click on it, right? Like you see the email, I go, I know this is a phishing email, but but damn, it looks good, right? It looks like the real deal, and, and sometimes it's a compelling story. You want it to be true, right? You want to click on it. You want this to be true, so it's amazing, right? The... Uh, and, and when you're doing that, uh, you know, the the very targeted, you know, spear phishing, you know, the people who put in the time to learn their audience and, you know, it's not a random email that's going out to everybody. It's it's targeted towards you. Right. So that's. I. I, I have to agree with you. Right. I mean, it's it's unfortunate that so many of us have gotten to the state of I don't click on anything. Right. I, I recently sent out a few emails and I thought, you know, the thing that I'm sending to these folks who maybe hadn't heard from me in a while, it looked like a phishing email to me. I said, I wouldn't mm -hmm. click on this. I, I put had to put in a few personal things whereby we knew each other and I, were, I promise this is not a phishing email. And I thought, well, that's exactly what the what the phishing person would do. So, you know, I, I don't know that I'm going to hear back from, from any of my friends that I, I reached out to. But... Uh, but thanks yeah, for I mean, what you're talking about there, Rory, is pretexting. You know, um, fishing has become a multi billion dollar industry. People frequently ask, they're like, why do people do this? I'm like, because it works, mm -hmm. right? Um, the, the underground, the black arts uh, businesses of the world still make lots of money on it. They have no problem spending time researching people, going up on Facebook and seeing, oh, I see Joe over here is connected to Sally over here. Oh, I see they had dinner a few weeks ago. Hey, Joe, remember that 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 fish you got when we were out at that restaurant? Um, so it's it's really becoming, you know, something you really got to be vigilant and stay very aware of and look at all of those key indicators on an email to see if it's a phishing email or not. And when in doubt, don't click, right? Yeah. Well, if I can, um, you know, one of the areas that uh, I've worked on a lot at Forthread is our our UX and design practices. 
And when we, t- when we add security to that, we always look at things from the lens of the user. And so when you think about any kind of user specific training, you think about the context of where they're at and you know wh- what they're in the middle of. Um, and it's gone to that point, Rory, where you were just discussing, you, know, you almost, you know it could be bad and you wanna click on it because that's your own interest. But I think in a typical situation for a, uh, a person that receives these things, they're just innocently doing their job. And so, you know, if your boss were to hit you up and ask you for a piece of information, right? Uh, and we can say, well, that seems like egregious or outside of the norm, or whatever. Uh, in many cases, these are multi-level attacks and um, they'll actually use a series of information to then build up to a bigger story. Um, and these are some of the best marketers in the world, these threat actors. They know how to get your attention probably better than anyone else. Uh, and then uh, not to go down this road, but you start throwing in the concept of generative AI. You know, a lot of uh, a lot of my clients, you know, will tell me things like, well, they're not looking to attack me. And I'm like, they don't have to. <laughs> that's the that's the thing. It's a it's not a what it used to you know, what we used to say is like a, a spray and pray. Whoever answers at this point in time, you just you attack everyone and the, the numbers go up. They, they don't go down, you know, so. Sure. I was looking this up uh, to your point, Frank. I was looking this up uh, uh, before the panel, and it, it, I don't know. There's the IBM has the the X Force, and and uh, Symantec has their 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 group as well. Uh, but they're both in agreement that uh, you know, I, I, we all consider what BEC, right? Business email compromise is is not only the leading factor of of compromise, but it's almost a hundred percent. It's well over ninety percent, depending on on who you ask, I'm talking 96 to 98 percent of all compromises begin through some through some form of email attack, and that's why we that's why we we berate our users to the point of almost almost making them angry. Um, but again, I you know it goes back. I, I would I would say this even with my own family. The last time I told my wife, please don't open attachments or click on links, she got very angry at me. You know, why are they sending it to me if I'm not supposed to open it? So even in our own homes, even, even, and I, I don't know about you guys, but I'll admit that I've, I've clicked a link or two that I shouldn't have clicked in my career and, and fortunately had the tools uh, that stopped it. But it's just, it, it's human nature. To, to your point, Heath, that's why it works. That's why they do right. it, because it works. Right. You know, not only is it responsible, you know, almost 100%, but we used to say it's 100% effective, right? Um, and this is, again, where user training comes into play, because if you, if you email, you know, a large company, right? A couple of thousand people, you're almost guaranteed somebody's going to click, right? I think that's getting better all the time. But we used to say, oh, it's it's 100% effective. How can that be? Well, it's if I, I guarantee you, at least at the time, if I if I was to send a a compromised email to all your users and you have you know a thousand, two thousand users in the organization, it's just about guaranteed that somebody would click what they weren't supposed to and then you know now the bad guys have you know some sort of access into your systems so along those lines uh heath uh someone had asked um that you had mentioned or talked about user education user training a few times so the question was hey how do i implement this in my organization without putting an uh, undue burden on the user's time, uh, you know, our team members already are busy. Everybody has full-time jobs. Are we now expecting them to also be um, cyber hygiene experts? What's your, what do you have to say there? Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a that's a good point. And I, I work with a lot of companies as we implement uh, security awareness training for them. And this is always this question always comes up, and it. Really, the, the the trick to doing this is is to having two components and limiting the amount of time it should take your users to be able to do this. So the first part, let's talk about security awareness training, the training itself. There's lots of systems out there that can do that. We have a service we offer. And as we put it together for clients, we sit down and we talk about trying to keep that training to no more than about 30 minutes a quarter, right? And that might be two or three different little video modules they have to watch and then take a little quiz afterwards. And the quiz isn't in depth. No one's trying to test people here to make sure they know the quadratic equation of cybersecurity, right? Um, They're just merely asking people 
questions about, you know, did you watch the video? Did you watch the video? Did you pick something up from it? Just putting that information in front of people. Uh, I find it's most effective when you do it on a quarterly basis, hold people accountable, and make sure it gets done, right? No more than a 30-minute engagement. You're always going to have the people that are going to be the stragglers and are always going to say, I don't have 30 minutes and a quarter to do this. Well, you do. You have 30 minutes and a quarter to do it. And uh, some of the people who would like to avoid doing it a lot of times are the more technical people in the group, right? Well, that's great. If you're more technical in the group, you could probably do it faster than 30 minutes. Um, the other piece that goes along with that, because, you know, just because training occurs doesn't mean learning occurs, right? So the other piece that goes along with that is testing out your security awareness training. So make sure you're doing a simulated phishing test on a regular basis, maybe one a month, tracking the results from that. If you catch somebody, they're going to have to go through a little bit more extra training to, to catch up. And don't make it hours of training. Make it like five minutes. Hey, this is what you did wrong, right? We contextually know what they did. We could contextually give them the training they need to have to make sure that we coach them up on the right things. Um, a lot of the times people will already know. They just had that little mind slip like Tim was talking about earlier. We've all been there. We've all got caught by something at one point in time. Um, it's how you deal with it after the fact. So that's how I usually say people should go about doing this and keeping it very, very focused. We like to curate that training for people. Uh, one of the big things that we're pushing out this quarter is uh, training on quishing or QR code phishing, right? Uh, QR codes in amongst themselves are wonderful. They're great. I ever see Rory's hiding his over there now. Um, but there was a <laughs> Frank's point to his. <laughs> Which one should you follow? <laughs> um there was a big thing recently in, in the media where there was a large uh, uh, metropolitan area that someone went around and put uh, fake QR code stickers over all the parking meters. And they were able to collect lots of money. I don't remember how much it was, but it was more than you would think just by people having to go through a man in the middle to pay their parking meter so they could do different things. So I, it's, it's got to be believe, vigilant with everything. I believe if you if you scan Frank's, you should immediately change your ATM code. Because he's <laughs> probably not a bad idea. I, I try to never scan a QR code, although they get me every once in a while. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> you know, when you think about, uh, you know, training users and the things, I, Heath, I love that you talked about that even though you train people, it doesn't necessarily, you know, it doesn't mean they learn. That's why you have to test folks. Um, and uh, I, I, there's, a, there's an interesting um, scenario here because you're constantly testing people. And, uh, you know, the, the goal there is that you're testing the effectiveness of your training and whether or not people are aware and so forth and so on. Um, and the hope there is that you're seeing a positive trend in, um, in you know, whether or not that, that they're catching all these things. One of the things that um, uh, recently I was in a conversation with a client about, uh, again, that service that you were just discussing um, is, uh, uh, you know, hey, this seemed like a very rudimentary uh, uh, fish. And I said, yes, uh, that is correct. We start small and then we get you know, more and more complex as time goes on. And I said, um, the fact that it's so rudimentary and you had a 30% click rate, uh, this kind of shows you that it doesn't have to be that complicated. Can it get complicated? Can it get very you know, in depth and, and have contextual awareness? Absolutely, and we will get there. But let's not worry about that until it becomes a problem. Because right now, hey, some I need money, click here. Uh, seems to be working just fine. So we don't need to worry about the generative AI and such like that. So I think that's a, that's a big one. Um, I love that we, we are able to showcase that for folks so that they can understand that um, and really put the users. You know, Rory, uh, I, I don't want to go back too much, but I did want to comment on something that you were discussing because you had given an example of, you know, the larger, I don't want to say larger, but, you know, thousand seats or something like that. I have to tell you that even an organization of sub 30 people, it only takes one, you know, that that's, that's the reality is that that thousand user right. firm that you described, right. They might have the tools and the, and the, and the, um, the, the services associated to actually uh, aid in that, you know, Tim uh, highlighted even in his own personal world, he had, he had the necessary tools. I'm not sure that the 30 person firm necessarily does. And, and so sure you send out the 30 people, it only takes one because they're also less mature, um, their controls are not as heavily in place. Um, and these are all part of that awareness that we talk to people, you know, about, you know, we talked about this specifically of this of fishing in general, but 
the user training in, in, in general goes beyond that and showcases like, hey, are you sharing this with more people than they need to be? Is this too open, right? That all that all parks is, uh, goes down to the, the frame of, you know, these privileges. You know, you could tell that to users or just make them aware, you know, um, who does and does not have access. You know, and there was a time when a 30 user company, right, they were all in the same office, right? If some of this stuff was going on today, hey, Frank, did you just send me this email? No, right? But, you know, it, it started during the pandemic and, and more and more people are remote. And you're, you know, when you're working with someone else at your office regularly and you're throwing emails back and forth, right? You're just, you're just used to getting an email trusting who it came from and, and clicking away, right? And that's that's exactly what what we see happening. Um, you know, uh, there was uh, there was a, a once upon a time, and this this is actually back when uh, when Heath and, and Tim and I were, were working together, um, someone uh, there was a, there was an email compromise. They were just sitting there watching. Uh, waiting for the right moment to send the right document with the correct misinformation on it, and uh, and a lot of money got sent to to the wrong place, and uh, or, and, and actually what happened and, and you know we don't like to talk about who or what or even what industry they were in, but um, there was uh, an attorney who who called um, an office worker. And said, "Hey, I don't have to do these wire transfers for you anymore." And she said, "What are you talking about? Remember when we went to the bank and we signed all that paperwork? I don't have to do the wire transfers for you anymore." Uh, so they verified that this was a very real-looking document that actually came from this person's email address, and um, and you know they had been compromised, and it was some third-party actor sending these documents. Um, so this was a very large uh, wire transfer into millions of dollars that did not occur because the attorney called in and said, um, and said, Hey, uh, I don't have to do these for you. Why don't you just do it yourself? But in this conversation, he said, wait, wait. So what about the 2.4 million from last week? And a week had passed and money had gone out and that money was, was long, long gone. Uh, again, people, you know, when when they're watching, if if they can compromise your email and watch the emails that are going back and forth, and at the right time, pretending to be you and actually using your system, they can send an email. It's pretty compelling. And next thing you know, you know, money can be going out the door. So there's a, you know, we can we can talk about the real world examples out there until we're all blue in the face, right? We've we've seen a lot of it out there. Right, I'll tell you this. I'll, I, 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 we might have beaten this topic to death, but I'll uh, at the an organization I've been working with for the last you know eighteen months or so, uh, heavy on instant response, and uh, a dedicated full time team just working business email compromise. I'm talking about four to five people. Their entire job was to respond to BEC concerns, and not from as I, I think uh, Frank pointed out earlier, not necessarily from what we would consider large enterprise, but their client base was largely uh, small to medium business. So these 30 person companies that are just being popped, you know, hour after hour after hour, and these are good people working hard, uh, but it doesn't take much of this to have a severe impact on your organization. It can be devastating. It can, it can, it can completely close you down. Uh, if you don't have the insurance in place, if you don't have the controls in place to, uh, to respond quickly. Yeah. So we talked about that for a while. Um, this would probably be a good time to to break. Yes, I think we're going to stop there for now. But we'll continue this conversation on August 8th. Everyone in attendance today will automatically be registered for the second part of this session. But we do have an episode before that. You don't want to miss our episode on July 25th. We'll be talking about ransomware. After all, July is Ransomware Awareness Month. Remember, you can catch up on the first four episodes 
by watching the recordings at success.forthright.com slash cyber series. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time.